This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 213 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show. Girls getting it done. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Our sponsors this week are Draper Therapies, Fleece Works, and Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of our terrific sponsors at StableScoop.com. Welcome to the Stable Scoop, with weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the stable, it's every week. They bring you the news through hail or high water, while using their tails as their own fly swatters. So sit on down and laugh till your poop, cause it's time again for Stable School. Stable School. Stable School. Howdy, everybody. Glenn the Geek here. And this is Helena B. You are listening to the Stable Scoop Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Do you remember how I said that we were having attacks of rattlesnakes in the neighborhood here? Yes. That there were so many rattlesnakes uh, showing up in our, our local neighborhood? Well, the, I was riding my bike yesterday, and I was riding about you know, half a foot maybe from the edge of the road. And there was this one section where there wasn't a house. Now, we have a, live in a equestrian neighborhood, so it's all fenced in properties, all five acres and pretty. And b- palm trees and all that stuff. Well, there was this one thing, a lot had been sold, so it was kind of, you know, the grass was grown up along the edge of the road. So I'm trying along, not particularly paying attention, and all of a sudden I see this movement out of the corner of my eye. And it was a rattlesnake that his head was up about six inches from my leg. Uh, and he saw me about the same time I saw him, and he turned and, and scooted off. I swerved, and if a car had been coming, I'd have been dead. Because, oh, my you know, gosh. when you see that, your first yeah. reaction is a swerve. You know, what are you yeah. going to do? <laughs> yeah. so, and you don't think about cars. You don't think about what's behind you or in front of you. You just swerve. And that's what happened, and I, I, would, have, I would have been squished. But, uh, and then I got to thinking, if he had gone after me, I was going a pretty good clip. I was probably doing 15, 16 miles an hour, which on a bike's going pretty good. And I was thinking, you know, if he had come after me, I don't know that he'd have gotten me, but what if he had ended up going in my spokes? Ah, I'd have been head over tea kettle with a rattlesnake stuck in my spokes. That would have been stuck great. Stuck in your tea kettle. <laughs> <laughs> a rattlesnake stuck in your tea kettle. Oh, you want to hear what else happened around? This is, not fu- this is not fun news, but it just goes to show you that this stuff does happen. You know, we get bad storms here all the time in Florida. Every day, it thunderstorms. In the afternoon, about 3 o'clock, we get a thunderstorm. Well, apparently one day last week during one of our bad thunderstorms, a horse was killed by lightning about two streets over. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, a, God. A dressage horse. Uh, she, uh, the people are up here from, they, they have a place in Wellington, too, and it was one of their dressage horses. Uh, it was very sad. And oh, you, my God. Did it hit him directly? I don't know. I haven't heard the exact story about whether it hit a tree and, you know, the tree came down or what the story was. But uh, it was, you know, that's something, you, you know, we all talk about whether you leave your horses in the barn or leave them out there in storms. But this, sometimes you're just not home, you know. Your horses are outside. What are you going to do? Um, but, yeah, it's something to think about. Jennifer is a little more careful now about walking outside and playing with the horse in thunderstorms. Yeah, you think? <laughs> Which she I, hasn't been very good about. So. Well, yeah. That, it's, oh. It does happen. It's not something you think about. But, I mean, it uh, happens to people, too. It's not yes. like, oh, my God, suddenly every horse is going to get struck by lightning. Right. It's still very much a rare occasion. But it does make you stop and think and maybe maybe change your game plan just a teeny bit. Yeah, Could you know, Jennifer has probably cautious. been hit by lightning three different times. Um, he's... <laughs> We call him the lightning rod because he's been hit three different times. Now, he was in the military, and uh, he was part of a Green Beret unit, and his job was a radio man. So he was carrying the big pack with the radio top, the antenna on top. Uh, so he was just a you know walking target. Uh, but, yeah, he survived all three of them. Uh, his hair stands straight up all the time now, but he survived. Uh, that was a joke. <laughs> well, it's not funny. I know, but we kid him about it because he's our brother-in-law. And who gets hit by lightning three times? 
All right, fine, great. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know what it is, Glenn? You started out with a, a horse died <laughs> and, <it's, laughs> and then wrapped it up with something funny. I don't know. All right. <laughs> where, where, what, 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 what do you want to talk about? We got some guests coming up. Today. What do I want to talk about? Um, I don't know. Now I'm all distracted by your brother-in-law getting hit by <laughs> lightning three times. Uh, we got some guests coming up today. Uh, one of them is Amanda Kalimian. Kalimian? Mm-hmm. Kalimian. Uh, who's president of the uh, Seraphim 12 Foundation, and they did something with the New York Mets we're going to find out about just two days ago. Sounded like a, a, a good event, and it looks like they, they, they did it for a good cause in Vols Horses. And then we're going to have a little hunt talk today, aren't we? Because a couple weeks ago we had Sissy Finn on. We had, and she was uh, trying to get me to get up there and, and go hunting again, and she succeeded, and it was... Just absolutely phenomenal. So I can't wait to blab about that. And, you know, when when we don't call it the adventures of Sista Finn for nothing, when Sissy and I get together, some really funny stuff happens. I mean, she's just a magnet for funny stuff. But when you put the two of us together, it, it just gets amplified. So we've got some good stories for you. And just as a teaser in the uh, show notes you have hit, written here, and I don't know anything about this yet, so I can't wait to hear about it. <laughs> you just have and this time it's wedding cake drama. <laughs> <laughs> the wedding cake, wedding cake and drama. A hunt. Yes, now, I'm trying to imagine how the two go together, but uh, we'll find out here in a, just a little bit. Plus, we have our tack and habit segment with the most expensive tack and habit product we've ever done. The most ex- absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think there might have been a hay steamer that came close. <laughs> no, it didn't really come close. No, but... not even close. Yeah, not even close. So All we're right, going to have that coming up as well. But first, let's take a break. For Fleeceworks, and we're going to be right back with Manda Kalimian, president of the Seraphin 12 Foundation. Fleeceworks manufactures pure Australian merino sheepskin and merino wool saddle pads and accessories. Their pads produce a vital thermal balancing layer to pull excess moisture and heat away from the horse's back, allowing muscles to work at maximum capacity without overheating. Fleeceworks Australian merino wool is breathable and hydrophilic, able to hold and store 35% of its own weight in liquid. A longtime staple of the medical field, Australian merino fibers have no equal when it comes to delivering a temperature-controlled, pressure-absorbing layer. The Fleeceworks philosophy, minimum bulk, maximum performance, and they have a variety of anatomically correct pads incorporating technologies and designs that address the individual needs of every horse and rider. Ask for Fleeceworks saddle pads and accessories by name at your local tack and feed store or visit them online at fleeceworks.com. Well, hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for joining us on Stable Scoop. Hi, Glenn. We appreciate you being here. Now, uh, tell us a little, before we get into what you guys were doing at the ballpark, tell us a little bit about uh, Seraphim 12 Foundation. First of all, where's that name come from? Uh, well, Seraphim 12 Foundation, Seraphim are, as you know, are angels. And uh, there are 12 horse angels, thus the 12. Uh-huh. And uh, yes, we are, we are, we do, do, we do tend to be a little bit on the spiritual side here. And just as there are angels for people, there are angels for horses. I did not know and, that. Wait a minute. Let's start, let's back up for a second. Are they, where are these horse angels recognized? Well, I, you know, it's sort of just, it's a no, you just sort of know. I mean, if people have angels, why don't animals? No, I think what she's asking is the 12 angels. I didn't know there were 12 horse angels. Right, like 12 yes. official horse angels. Yeah. Well, there are 12 official horse angels. There are, they are in a group, and Pegasus is the leader. The focus of the foundation is to promote education and awareness about abuse, neglect, and slaughter of America's horses. And is you it, know, as I'm sorry, is this all on. horses, or, just, or or are we talking mustangs, or just all horses? Oh, we are talking about all four-legged horses, it's all horses, all over the world. Okay. You know, we we are focusing as a really, we are you know we focus on American horses because we're here in America. But the truth is, it's a global problem, and um, you know we have to start here, and then work our way uh, around the world. And so the, the, your mission seems to be um, really creating this bond of compassion through education, 
through what are the the venues that are you that you're using to help create this new perspective about Colleen, horses? That's, a, that's exactly right. Um, the only way that you can um, affect any sort of change is through education, and that is through awareness. And education is the only way, and through compassionate and humane educational programs is the way to teach people about what is going on in today's world with horses. Horses, you know, as everybody knows, horses were the, are the backbone of our country. I mean, we wouldn't be who we are today or here if there wasn't a horse carrying us around from place to place or pulling a cart or helping us build or forge a river or a stream. And, you know, what's happened is as modern technology and civilization has evolved, the use of the horse, the horse's main, you know, focus and purpose has sort of changed. And so people have lost their bond or understanding of partnership with their horses. And horses have just become, you know, for some people, yes, like us, we love our horses and we see them as friends, companions, and pets, but for mostly everybody else, they see it as a vehicle and a means to make money off of, a disposable item. So now, do you guys, are you in the adoption business? Do you adopt horses yourself, or are are you in the education business? No, we do. We are not a rescue, and we are not a sanctuary. Of course, in the beginning of um, the process, in order to to understand fully all the different ramifications of the problem, I have, um, we have rescued about 16 or 18 horses from the slaughter. We've taken them from, you know, old, um, older, retired show horses that had no place. We've taken a few from sanctuaries that were unable to keep them. But that was really for our education. We are a vehicle of awareness and promoting educational programs. Well, and, and that's what caught Helena's I, <laughs> Helena and I's attention is anytime a horse organization does something in the mainstream to, to get non-horse people interested and involved, it catches our attention. And you just, you had this little thing you did the other night. You don't start small. <laughs> uh, you had this little yeah, thing yeah. you did the other night at a baseball game. Tell us what happened. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> With a little thing, all right. Um, well, we put on what we want to call our first hooves on first, which uh, which was at City Field in conjunction with the New York Mets and um, David Katz, who is a friend and a board member and partner of City Field and the Mets, um, very generously and brilliantly came up with the idea. You know let's use that venue to reach out to people. And, and, you know, it's the perfect place or opportunity to to get people's ear and and to spread the message. The focus for Seraphim are not as much, we want horse people, because there are many horse people that have many misconceptions about horses, slaughter today, humane euthanasia, and and things like that. But the focus really is non-horse people. Non-horse people, there isn't a person in this world that you ask if they like horses. Everybody likes horses, whether they have one, seen one, or ever ridden one. Everybody loves horses. Everybody's wanted a pony when they were little. You know, horses are magic. They are. They are magic, and they're magic to everybody. And so the thing is to, to reach out to the American people and to let them know that the state of the world for horses today is is very is terrible, and men, much of the information that we offer people is going to have a significant if they like horses or they care could have a significant impact when they go to to, to vote because they may say you know when they get into that voting booth they may say oh wait a second you know this guy he voted, He, you know, he's pro-slaughter, and I'm not pro-slaughter, and I don't believe in that, and this other, you know, candidate is not. So it might have an impact on on voting and, and government. So the idea is to make a change through informing. I mean, let, let's face it, we, most of us, and a lot of horse rescue organizations, and even educational organizations, we preach to the choir because we find that our audience is already 
people who are invested in the welfare of horses. So yeah. here you are. I mean, you know, City Field is just the most perfect venue for getting your message out. And you're telling these people the state of horses in our country right now is horrible. And are you actually saying to them, go out and help us by voting? What what kind of call to action are you asking this new audience? Well, good question, Helene. Our call to action is, why I want to say two things. I said the first thing we say to people is, listen, because you know, Everybody thinks if you're a charity, it, and it's a terrible thing. The first thing people think is you want money. Oh, my God, please go away. And, and it's true. And, and, yes, of course, everybody needs money to run their organization. But our call to action is to tell somebody else, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, tell your family about what is happening with horses. We want everybody to talk about it. Talk, 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 talk. We want it to be, you know, we want it to be a huge network of the of communities talking about it, because our talking about it and people talking about it is only going to help the rescues, sanctuaries, humane organizations in their communities. We want people to not turn a deaf eye or ear if they're driving down the street and they see their neighbor has a horse in their backyard and it's. And then you can obviously see it's malnourished or it's neglected. We want them to want to make a phone call to somebody to say, hey, look what's happening here. You know, so many people don't do that. Right. It's sort of like a like that see something, say something that we all we well, all yes. embraced after 9-11. It's like so. So there's an awareness. You want to create awareness and then and hope that uh, hope. people will act on it in whatever way is appropriate for that given place and time. That's exactly right. And, and Helene, let me just say, through that simple action, through people, because the end result of Seraphim's long-term goal and focus is, you know, we see horses as our educational ambassadors. Horses are different than any other animal on the planet. And us and those of us horse people, we know that. Most people don't, but they are different than other animals. They offer, there is no animal that you can tell me about or even person that offers the kind of therapeutic benefits that horses do today. The therapeutic benefits and programs that horses are engaged in, it's, it's a countless number. And every day, you know, there are new programs being de designed and developed around horses. You know, now we have programs for our war veterans. Now we're taking little miniature horses and using them as, not to replace, but as well as seeing eye dogs for handicapped people. You like, know, every I gotta day. i got to tell you, my cat certainly doesn't do that for me. He just stresses me <laughs> out. <laughs> well, you know, cats can do that, I think. You're a little more independent. Our, my, my cat's name is the Beast. Does that tell you something? That's his name. <laughs> and it's a very fitting name. And it's a I, fitting name me. for this cat. It's a fitting uh, name. I want to get back to the Mets here. You can walk right by that. Because, I'm sorry. Anyway, yes, because now you're at, the, well, you're at the stadium. Uh, i, I got to get back I'm to this because you I had can, Joey. I can do that. You had Joey. So that... We had Joey there. We had Joey there. Now we should it tell was, everybody who Joey is. Joey, the war horse puppet, joined us in our mission to promote advocacy, you know, in, in our country for American horses, for the horses, to make a statement. I think it's kind of neat that they, they got, you got Joey from the play to come down. And, of course, that play in, in uh, New York only runs through uh, the beginning of January, and then it ends there. It, it, uh, they're on a roving tour right now of the country. Um, they and, are. They are They are going on a 30-city tour. Yep, and we're, they're actually coming down to Tampa, Helena, down here in Florida, and, and Wendy, and, and we're going to try and get a bunch of the listeners together and all go over to Tampa and, and uh, see it over there. But uh, No, you, you should. You should. And you also and had uh, Paul Rogers supportive. there. We did. I'm sorry. We had Paul Rogers there, and that was just fantastic. Are you familiar with his work? Yeah, he's um, um, and he just had the "With Our Love," and I, I know that that was one that you that uh, that's one of his releases, and it, it charted off pretty good on the on the charts. Started off pretty good oh. on the charts, and I know that he uh, that proceeds you know of that are going to you it. guys, right? 
Yes. Well, here's okay. the, let me just quickly tell you the story behind that. I am so excited that, yes, you are a classic rock listener, and um, With Our Love was created by, um, there's a gentleman, his name is Perry Margulis, who um, you can see that on the With Our Love information and he is a very good friend of Paul's and Perry is another friend of the foundation and they created this as you said yes and um, Paul and his wife Cynthia are big uh, um, horse supporters and they have their own charity in England race for sanctuary that they support so Perry being a seraphim friend and Paul being a friend of his you know, his particular charity in England teamed up. And, you know, it's sort of great. We're bringing, it's sort of bridging uh, the continent, America and England coming together, right, for the cause, for horses. And they've created that song. And uh, it is, there will be, there is an album now in the process being created around this. And with our love, it's about, you know, our love for our horses. Well, that's terrific. I'll play a little bit of it uh, here to take the show out today. You can find out more about Seraphim, and that's spelled S-E-R-A-P-H-I-M, 12foundation.org, uh, by going to their website, and you can find out more of the information. Congratulations on, on getting it done with the Mets there the other night. Um, and, and, you know, good luck with your continued work. As you said, we're all horse people here, so we... We want to see what's good for the horse, and, and I'm glad that you're out there educating people who just don't know. Oh, Glenn, thank you so much. And, Ken, if I could just add, you know, we do have a letter writing campaign, and if you do go to the website, we have a downloadable PDF that we have a letter to President Obama and to representatives, so we do ask people to please sign the letters, asking them to please support the American Horse Slaughter Prevention Act. I can testify. Our host of the eventing radio show, Samantha Clark, caught up with Kat from Draper Therapies while they were both hanging out in England. So let's take a listen to what she found out over there. Kat, welcome back to the eventing radio show. We're so happy to have you on. Let's, um, I don't even know where to start. Let's talk all about Blenheim. You've just um, spent the week there. First of all, you did the fantastic um, promotion with the, the course walking and the Draper Therapy socks and the Draper Therapy huge grand prize draw. How did all that go and who's the big winner and what did they choose? Well, we haven't decided on a winner yet. Um, we actually were going to choose them when we got back to the States just because it's been kind of a disarray with service and all that. We wanted to do a big grand slam and really get in touch with that person. So stay tuned. We will be in touch soon as far as who won. Um, but as far as how it went, it was amazing. Like we didn't know what to expect because this was our first year and you know, it was new for the event organizers and things like that. And people really seemed to grab on to doing it and horse and rider and pony magazine did a fantastic job of pushing the hunt for us um so it was really exciting but i think people um really enjoyed that because when you're out doing the course walk you know it's it's a long walk for you know you to be on foot doing that and it added a fun element to it so that you were kind of really looking at the jump and really looking at the signs to see who was sponsoring it and what the jump was all about you know was it a table was it a drop was it this was it that so it was really fun um we saw a lot of people even when we were walking it by ourselves the course that people had the scavenger hunt cards and, you know, we give them little tips and hints and things and they were so excited to have it. So we were cheating a little bit, but it made it very fun for everybody. So, I mean, even if people didn't get it completed, we were more than willing to just let people get involved and, you know, help them out where we could. And I think it really added a really good element to the whole thing for everybody. So it was Plus, good. Yeah. And they had the added incentive of those Draper therapy socks that Glenn's always raving about. Yes. Well, people, it was funny because the first um, Thursday and Friday, we ended up taking the officials, which to us is volunteers and, you know, the people who are really helping behind the scenes make the show possible. And we went on a course walk with Eric Winter on Thursday and Friday. And 
after everybody was done, they did the, um, the scavenger hunt along with the course walk. So when they got done, you know, and they had to be on their feet all weekend, we got so many praises later on when we saw these volunteers out working the show. They were like, oh, my gosh, my feet feel amazing. This made such a huge difference. So it was very rewarding to hear that you know, short of a time period on how everybody had been doing with the socks and how much fun they had. And it was really great. (laughs) Brilliant. Well, let's talk about Blenheim. So you obviously walked the course and, um, and the palace. What did you think? It was, I, to be honest, like I have always like admired events in Europe and I've, you know, as a rider, I've always looked forward to coming over to Europe and seeing what the horse industry is like here. And it is like nothing else. And then when you have the palace added into it, and we actually got to go to, like, the rider, like, champagne toast and things like that. So we were invited. And we got to meet a lot of the riders and things like that. But we also got to get introduced to the Duke and Duchess of Marlborough, which isn't presented to a lot of people. So it was very unique and very humbling and just wonderful to be able to get that unique opportunity. So there were so many firsts that we had. And it's just I'm left with so many amazing things to be able to say about the event in Blenheim Palace and everybody who was involved with it. I know you've set the the bar pretty high now. If that's your first year, <laughs> I know. Oh, I can't even imagine. I mean, and then it's just been fantastic because we've basically gone back into London now, and we've gotten to see a lot of the sites. But we've met with a lot of um, retailers here, which again, I, it doesn't strike me as having a place to be able to buy equestrian apparel here in London, and we've been able to do that. Like, so that's so y- unique to what Europe is for the horses. And so I've, we've just had such a good time. <laughs> good. Did, uh, were you able to see any of the Paralympic parade? I think that was the last day today. Were you able to see any of that? We caught the tail end of it. We kind of got a whole run around with it. It was a mess because we didn't know where we were going. And they had a lot blocked off. And it was a little bit hard. But we did get to see a lot of them on the streets that were heading to the parade. And it was very exciting to be able to overhear them and talk to them a little bit about what they were doing. And the whole city was abuzz with everything today. So it was just a really great day. And I can understand why people are so almost sad and disheartened after everything because this has been a whole summer of an amazing events with athletes of all you know caliber here and now it's all over yeah can we look at where can we see your photos is that the draper therapies facebook page there are some on the draper therapies facebook page or you can just um type in cat at at draper um and that'll be my draper therapies like professional facebook account and i've posted every photo i've taken in, in london and in woodstock while i've been here so there's tons of stuff to look through at least on my facebook page oh what fun well thank you so much for sharing all your adventures and um yeah we look forward to hearing all about we'll look we'll look out for you on downtown abbey <laughs> It was so, oh my gosh. And that was funny is because I kept feeling like I was reliving that. It was like with the side cell and the hunt and the hounds and then Blunt and Palace. Yeah, it was just amazingly cool. So, <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for updating us, Kat. And we'll speak to you soon. Okay, thank you. So this is the best part of the show. <laughs> this is my favorite part of the show. Where we get to talk about how I went hunting. <laughs> it's all about you, Helena. It's all, oh, it should be. I'm telling you, I have turned a corner. Life is all about me from now on. I'm coming out from underneath the rock I've been living under. Um, Actually, it has been quite a number of years. Well, I say quite a number of years. It's been at least three years since I've gone out hunting, four years since I hunted regularly. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I only got out once or twice before we moved to Rhode Island. Um, And then before that, of course, it was Zeke and I were going out regularly. But um, so I ride out with the Myopia Hounds um, just north of Boston here in Massachusetts. And uh, it's a great, great hunt. It is a drag hunt. It's not live. And uh, they have a new huntsman this year. They have uh, new joint masters. Kim Cutler and Ted Meem have taken the place of our beloved Donald Little, who passed away earlier this year and who was greatly missed. But uh, Kim and Ted have stepped up to the plate and have just been so welcoming and have provided great leadership. And um, they found a wonderful new huntsman, Brian Keeley. And uh, I got guess he's Irish. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) good guess. He's just he's wonderful with the hounds. And um, it was really it was a pleasure to be out with them. Sissy and I are going to tell you all about um, our adventures. It was she who convinced me to haul up to Hamilton and and uh and head out with them i i've been really nervous about it since 
my ACL surgery and all kinds of confidence issues that come with, you know, being a solitary backyard horse owner and rider. I didn't know if I could, if I could handle it. Uh, I didn't know if my body could handle it and I didn't know if my mind and heart could handle it. Well, it turns out I had no problem (laughs) handling it. So we're going to talk to Sissy and, uh, and give you a play by play on what it's like to hunt with the myopia hounds. Welcome back, Sissy. We've got a lot to talk about this time, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, Sissy says, Helena, you need to come back up here and go hunting. And I say, okay. Well, ho- well let, me, let me stop you for one second, not to interrupt. But Helena calls me a few weeks back and she says, oh, I'm coming to get my hair cut. Maybe we can hang around. I said, well, if you're coming to get your hair cut, you're sleeping over and you're coming hunting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty much it. There's no okay. argument there, I'm sure. <laughs> I was like, hmm, how can I finagle this? So, um, it, you know, it takes nothing less than an act of Congress to get me off my own farm. So, but, and a good haircut. So, uh, and, and of course, there's all this fun stuff that's going on up in Hamilton around this time. There's the Boston Equestrian Classic. There are pre-classic cocktail parties. Obviously, there's hunting. So... Sissy so says, well, go ahead, go get your hair cut. And then there's the Essex County Trails Association cocktail party the night before. And all I hear is cocktail. And I'm like, I'm in. I'm good. Count me in. So, um, <laughs> so we, we get all our stuff together and uh, I get my hair cut. It looks fabulous. We go out to this cocktail party, which is on the show ground. So it's under this really cool tent. It's got this fun surfer theme and... Yes, it was. It was a good time. But we couldn't stay out too late because we had to get up and go hunting in the morning. That's right. right, And we wanted to. It was a good party. So tell us about hunting. So the funny (laughs) thing is, (laughs) the funny thing is, so I'm I'm sleeping over Sissy's house. This is my first time ever there. And it's this huge, really old, really awesome antique house. And um, so we get home and we're like, of course, you know, we're sort of half in the bag. And she's like... Okay, we'll wake up at 6 o'clock. I said, okay, we'll set our alarms. I'll set my phone. You set your alarm. Wake me up. We got all our stuff. We got our bridges. We got our boots. We got our saddlebags. We got everything. So at 6 o'clock in the morning, of course, I, neither of us can sleep all night long. We're tossing and turning. We're excited. We drank too much. We're excited. We're hunting in the morning. <laughs> so I finally get up at like 5.30 and I'm padding around the house. Like, what do I do? I'm up, you know. And then I hear her. She gets up. And the two of us are walking past each other, getting ready, getting dressed, talking to each talking to ourselves. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And she's like, what? I'm like, nothing. I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to myself. And she's like, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> well, the good news is, Helena, I hunt all the time. And so I usually have that conversation by myself and nobody even hears me. <laughs> so it was good to have somebody else doing the same crazy things that I do every time I go hunting. And the funny thing is, is that we do, we get, it's this nervous excitement. You know, there yeah. is, you know, we're, uh, let's face it, we're, we're some middle-aged moms who hunt and it's an adrenaline rush because it's a little bit scary. It's thrilling. And so there's this nervous excitement. And even when I was hunting all the time with Zeke, I still had this feeling of, oh, I got to make a list. Do I have everything I need? What's the day going to be like today? What's my horse going to be like today? Is it going to be fast? What crazy people are going to be out? Mm-hmm. So... You do have this sort of anxiety in the morning. And not to mention, once you get out there, you really don't want to forget something essential. Right. So, (laughs) yeah, yeah. Or your fly whisk when, you know, if there's deer flies in the woods or something. Right. Just don't want to be caught without that thing you're totally going to need. And for every hunt, you totally need something. Like a flask. Right. Or a juice box for something. Or a juice box. Tell them about your juice boxes. That was pretty cool. (laughs) Well, I have a proper little sandwich case and, you know, in the sandwich case, you're supposed to have a flask with port or something in it and you're supposed to have a sandwich. Well, I have asthma. So in my sandwich case, I have an inhaler where the flask would go and then where the sandwich case would go, I keep a juice box because I'm always so thirsty out there. And then if I need a flask, I just keep a hip flask in my jacket, but you got to love a juice box out in the hunt field where you have to stick the straw in while you're trotting along. <laughs> try not to get it on yourself. Try not to drop your reins. Try not to drop any trash. But I hooked <laughs> Helena up with some juice boxes for her uh, saddlebag as well. So we were, we were pretty cool. You get parched out there. You definitely do dry up 
because yeah. again, it's that, and it's always, you know, it's the first like five minutes when you, after the hounds move off, it's that first five minutes because that's, that really tells you how the rest of the hunt is going to be that sort of pace. And yeah. it, you know, you could move off in a real smooth and calm fashion, or you can just, you can take off, boom, you're going. Right. And now this is the first time I'd ever ridden the horse. Um, Myopia Stables was kind enough to lease me a horse for the day. And um, I'd heard of him. I knew he had a good reputation, but I'd never ridden him before. And a lot of people who are guests of the hunt will often ride the guest horse before they actually hunt on him or her. Just so you're not really getting to know each other on that, that first exciting ride. Yeah, well, I've never been that lucky. <laughs> I've always, they've always been like, here, oh, we've switched your horse. You can ride this one. I've never had the luxury of getting to know the horse I've hunted first. So this was no different. So the stables, they, they get the horse to the hunt. I meet them there. And uh, he's absolutely this adorable leopard Appaloosa named Mo, which is short for Geronimo. He's not a big guy. <laughs> name he's, for a hunt horse. <laughs> totally. <laughs> He's perfect, the perfect size for me. So um, the escort from the stable says, well, you know, here he is. And, um, you know, he's, he's a little up today. He might be a little up. So the first red flag goes off. He's a little Never up. Never want to hear that. Yeah. So, well, was he ridden yesterday? And, and if so, how was he? Oh, yeah, well, he did one lesson yesterday and he was up. So I say... Um, Okay, we'll define That's code up. for you're going to get your breeches dirty. Well, in the very next, <laughs> yeah, yeah, among other things, in the very next sentence, I hear, so he might give you a little buck or two. <laughs> now, mind you, this is when I have one foot in the stirrup and the other one swinging over his back. <laughs> so I'm committed at this point. I have really done a lot to get here. My yeah. foot's in the stirrup. I've made it this far. You're going. I, d- I said, I'm going to ride this rodeo. <laughs> I don't care what he gives me. I'm not turning back. And I'm thinking to myself, gosh, darn it, it never fails. So I said, all right, well, whatever. I'll, I'll just have to ride whatever he gives me. And um, you know what? He was a little up in the first, like, 100 feet. And once we got settled in, he was phenomenal. This guy knew his job. He kept his pace. He was sure-footed. He had a soft mouth. He responded to your seat. You know, it was like I couldn't have asked for a better mount for the day. I fell in love. Right. He was in great. Ten minutes. It was the fastest. I've never felt fallen for a guy as fast as I did for Geronimo. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. We gotta get you back out here on him again. Oh I know. He was So an now angel. let me ask you a couple questions. This was uh they were exercising the hounds. What does that mean? It's not an official hunt season hasn't started yet. No, we're cubbing. We are hunting. Cubbing. Okay, and what's that mean? That is when they introduce the young hounds to the hunt field. So they, but is it just the young hounds, or they did they add the young hounds to the old hounds? They have some of the young hounds coupled to the older hounds, which means they have them both uh, connected by the neck. Oh, uh, I've seen the, the way little... they run around like nuts. I can see them hanging themselves with that. Arrangement. Jeez. No, it, it works. It works oh, pretty it? well. It's 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 not uncomfortable for them. It's so just, one doesn't go on one side are... of the tree, and the other doesn't go on the other <laughs> side of the tree. Well, they attach the young hound to a hound that has proven himself or herself that knows their job, that's not going to do silly things, and that's just going to go along. Okay. Um, I have a fox hound at my house who lives with me. His name is Battle, and he's two, and he used to work at Myopia, but he didn't do his job very well. And in, it's funny, the, the uh, calendar from last year came out and there's battle on, in one of the pictures coupled to another hound looking so sad, like, Oh, I can't even do my own job, you know? So it's good that they have, they couple them to a very experienced hound. So they, they don't really run into much trouble. No. And that's how they learn the ropes. It's, it's so was they that one of those quick. that the red guys in the red coats were always chasing off into the woods someplace because he was out by himself. <laughs> um, he would just turn around and go back to myopia. <laughs> that's it. I'm out of here. Yeah. I hate this job. <laughs> if they didn't couple him, he has, he has a good nose because he's a hound and he would just go back. <laughs> this job sucks. <laughs> that's right. And he would go back. So now he just lives with me, which is fine. He's a lovely hound. 
And uh, do they, sweet, I mean, do it, well, now that you got me off on that tangent, we <laughs> we have a greyhound, so you know we know a little bit about hounds anyway. Right. But uh, do they make good pets? The uh, the the foxhounds like that? Oh, they're just wonderful because they've lived in a um, usually in a kennel their whole lives. So when you, it's almost like you rescue a dog. You know, if you bring a dog home that hasn't really lived in a house. It, once you get them house trained, they're just so appreciative. They're like, oh, I get to live here. I get to do this. So I, from my experience, and I have quite a few friends that have retired foxhounds or foxhounds that couldn't do their job. They, they're lovely animals. Are they kind of like the greyhounds that pretty much just sleep 95% of the time and then the other 5% of the time go crazy? Um, no, Battle's yeah. pretty – well, I think he's a typical hound. He, um, he likes to move a lot. You know, we have an invisible fence here, and he goes around the house. There's a track around my house he's made, because you can see where he goes in a big circle around my house. But keep, <laughs> keep make a note of the invisible fence comment, because we're going to come back to that in a minute. Okay, oh. so, so, so you got to tell me, um, you, you kept your pants clean there, Helena? Kept your breeches white? I kept my breeches white. There was a moment there. We, we hit a couple of bees that I, I thought maybe <laughs> my breeches might not be so white. Yeah, <laughs> the end, we did hit bees. At the end of the ride. But you know... There's a strategy in, in, in the fall up here in New England, um, we have ground wasps and they're everywhere. They're not just out in the woods that you can have them around your home or whatever. But what happens is when the front field passes through a, a particular path or a trail, they, they stir up the bees through the pounding on the, the ground. So the back field, the, either the second flight or the hilltoppers, tend to run into the already very mad bees. Okay, so the less inexperienced riders get the bees. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So what you do is, it, and you, what you start to see is the more you hunt, you start to, A, know where the bees are going to be. And two, yeah. you start to recognize the, the small little geographic um, microcosms, like places that are, are a good fit for ground bees. And so you back off a little bit from the uh-huh. front field, which gives you plenty of room to gallop like a bat out of hell yeah. <laughs> when someone yells bees. So there's a strategy for getting through them. And we did hit two patches of bees, which we got through just fine. There were really no issues. Um, but the third group got us by surprise, wouldn't you say, Sissy? Yeah. And we, a lot of people got stung and a lot of horses got stung. Ooh. But That's, nobody came off. Thankfully. Nobody came off. And there were some little kids out there. And mm-hmm. uh, I think Mo got a couple on his belly. And he, he just sort of pee-offed. He, he, went, you know, he went straight up and down but forward at the same time. And mm-hmm. you know what it is when it's happening. Like once your horse sort of lift, tucks his belly up, you know what's going on. And you right. just put both those legs on and they're happy to go forward. You know, they're yeah. happy for that direction. Yeah. Um, and, and you have to keep going because the bees will stick with you. They, yeah. They'll fly with you for a fair amount of time. So you got to go. You got to go. And they're fast. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it sounds kind of scary, but I was just going to say, say, okay, this sounds thrilling so far. <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst. That's really the worst of it. The other is, I mean, I don't know about you, Sissy. It's sometimes like every hunt is different in that it could be the temperament of the field of the group of riders that you're out. It could be the terrain. It could be the speed. It could be the weather. It could be how the hounds are working that day. Yeah. And so I think for this particular hunt, I thought it, it moved along pretty well. Yeah. And yeah. You know, it's how you handle your horse. You know, how do you trot downhill? Do you, when do you stay in your half seat? Which for me is most of the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, wh- what do you do with your leg when you're going uphill and downhill? How do you, you know, can you keep your leg perpendicular to the ground on buried terrain? Um, rocks, how to avoid rocks and roots. Yeah. How to, you know, when to let your horse make the decisions as to where to put his feet and when you need to make those decisions. Unfortunately, so this- I think as fox hunters, we go out there and we're not worried at all about equitation. We are more worried about staying in the saddle because every step is so different out there. You know, of course, you want to sit up straight, keep your heels down and, and keep all your riding experience close. However, some of us don't. Well, the so sober ones do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that's not as rampant as you might think, because really, because it's, I, it's not formal season yet. Come on. You no, know, it's after the hunt when everybody yeah. starts to imbibe. Which I got to tell, tell a story, though, because, you know, Jennifer used to hunt with you guys up there. Well, there's a little liquid courage involved. And, and I won't say who, but uh, 
big big tall guy and if i was directing traffic that day was stop uh, they have people that stop uh traffic at when they cross roads yeah, so we we would go out ahead and we would stop the traffic for when they came across the roads and this big tall guy on a big horse um comes i don't know if he was a red coat or not but a red coat we stop <laughs> He comes, he comes <laughs> right pink across. pink coats or scarlet. It's appropriate to be a red coat when you're up in England, New England. So he comes across, and literally, the, the field just stops on the other side of the road, and he just went, and fell oh, right off yeah. his horse, just right off the side. And, uh, of course, there was no alcohol involved in that particular situation. Um, and then we had to help him get back on his horse. But uh, you do see that occasionally. That's an occasional thing. You're right. It, it is. It's not everybody. I'm just no. getting around about that. It's so- and, and it is kind of funny when it happens, as long as no one gets seriously <laughs> hurt. Right. But Usually yeah, we will say the... It's a slow motion instead of... It is. It was like something out of a... off your horse. It was like something out of a, uh, you know, a comedy. <laughs> to slide out. You do your... Because you become yeah, like yeah. liquid. You're so relaxed. Yeah. You just you're, not, sort of... you're not racing for the fall. You just go. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> just going off your horse. Right. Like on Thanksgiving, for example. You really can't help to imbibe a little bit. Because we have checks along the way on Thanksgiving. We're out hunting for four hours. And we stop at people's houses um, along the way. And, you know, folks, for example, there's one stop where the the folks that own the house come out to the field and they give us all um, hot beef consomme with sherry in it. I mean, it just goes on and on all day. (laughs) Things like treats like that. So we're really all very relaxed, especially on Thanksgiving. It is uh-huh. one of the prettiest things to see, especially the Thanksgiving hunt, because you get so many people that come out every Thanksgiving to watch. You get so many yeah. spectators along yeah. the way, and people will drive from point to point so they can see the the, the field go through. And, and it's a big field that day, you know, in the, uh, you know, hundred. Yeah, everybody people. and their brother comes out for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Which yeah. I, I tend to stay away from that, but. Well, before we totally run out of time here, we have teased it the whole show. And I'm dying to know because I don't know the story either. What is it about the wedding cake? Oh. So after a long day, right? (laughs) So the equestrian classic was the next day. And um, I had helped a a jumper show, right? Yes. Yes. Um, I had helped a friend run the patron tent. We were there all day. And about 730, we were still there at night, taking down the decorations. And my phone rang. And, um, you know, I had Helena Friday night, the party Friday night. We hunted Saturday. We set up Saturday, Sunday all day. But the horse show, 730, Sunday night. My phone rings. It's the environmental police. Environmental and I think. Police. I didn't know there were environmental police. Right. I'm like, do I have an oil spill? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I think that it's like a scam, a fundraising scam, you know, where they call and they say, this is the state police. We want to raise money, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so, yeah. I, so I hang up because <laughs> I am tired and I have no time to play with these people. So I hang up, and one minute later, my phone rings again, and now I'm really annoyed because this person has called back. So I said, hello, and he said, yes, this is so-and-so from the environmental police. Do you have a dog named Fergus? And I said, oh, I do. Is he okay? And he said, well, he's fine. I am up at the Willowdale Estate, which is a wedding venue next to my house. And he said, and your dog um, is here. And I said, oh, well, I'll send my husband right up to get him. Um, What's going on? And he said, well, he's been eating the wedding cake. (laughs) Before before the wedding? Yes. Oh, which they just paid $3,000 for at least if you live in Hamilton. Yeah. (laughs) And I don't know how nobody saw if if I can just paint this big hound eating the cake. (laughs) No, it's Fergus. He is actually a yellow lab that weighs about 160 pounds. And he lumbers. He is so fat and Low. Well, There's no way nobody could see him heading now. towards the cake. Right. <laughs> so after that crazy weekend, I have to go and deal with the dog and the wedding cake and the environmental police. And come to find out, I live inside, well, not come to find out that I live inside Bradley Palmer, but I live inside the state park. And there's environmental police that are here all the time. And I didn't even know that. And I've lived here for two years. Good so God. I hope I the know? environmental police don't carry guns. I, I don't think they do. Oh, good. <laughs> What do they carry? Like bow and arrow? Yeah, they spray <laughs> they of some defend sort. themselves against like, bears yeah. and oh, strange people. So they carry for breeze. <laughs> 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 
Whatever so works. Did, do, okay, now wait a minute. Yeah, this is uh, this is my highlight of the day right here. You're just making my day. So now you get there and your dog is eating. What the heck happened when you got there? Well, they weren't that happy. And no, I, I can't imagine. Well, Helena, should we back up one more step? I'm not sure if you're listening. Yes, to we me. had to tell Funny. them. This is back back. Okay. So Helena and I, when we get up Saturday morning to go hunting, we went out into my driveway and my dog, I, I have two dogs, the lab and the foxhound. They were out in the driveway and the trash, they pulled the trash out of my trash barrel, was everywhere, all over the driveway. But I don't have time to pick this up because I got to go hunting. I used to be on a horse soon, so I get in the car and off I go. That's Saturday morning. Sunday morning, I get up, and I let the dogs out, and Fergus comes back, and he's got a Ziploc bag hanging out of his bottom. <laughs> oh, no. So not only not did they not... Not stuck to. All right, that's a story I didn't need. Sorry, I didn't need that story. So not only did they not see this lumbering dog coming to the <laughs> wedding cake, but he's got the Ziploc bag hanging out of his oh. bottom. Oh, <laughs> How do you not run the other way when you see that? So did they like, um, what did they do about the cake? Well, he just took a few bites. And um, (laughs) so I. (laughs) Can you imagine telling the bride this? Well, you know, they will talk about it for generations. I mean, they'll be old. An old couple, and they'll say, "Remember, did they just cut that part of the cake out and put some?" Did they just cut that part of the cake out and put some icing over it, or what? I don't know what they did. I I took my dog and I ran home. When do you get the three thousand dollar bill for the cake? Nobody has sent me anything, and nobody's tried to burn my house down. (laughs) Thanks. This poor bride. Can you imagine? (laughs) No, I can't imagine. The dogs went through the invisible fence. They just ran through it. So, well, for cake, I would too. Me too. Me too. I wonder how many cakes he's eaten that they that uh, nobody knows about over at that place. <laughs> yeah, right. For, that for, I bet you that wasn't his first wedding cake. <laughs> may not, he's a big boy. It may not have been. Okay, <laughs> that's hilarious. I've heard about. That's the best one of the day. That's only just great. me, only my life, only my dog. <laughs> all right, we're about out so of that time. That was a big weekend. It's all in all, it was a big weekend. That's the funniest story ever. <laughs> It's um, always an adventure. This is why we call it the Adventures with Sister Finn. You just never know what's around the corner. Because it, it's always something. Well, next weekend is the parade. So I'm sure something will go down. We're hunting before we um, go on the parade for two hours. So hopefully all our horses will be good and tired. And then we'll be marching down Main, um, uh, Main Street in Hamilton in the parade. So. Well, you have a terrific time. Be safe. Thank you so much for coming by to share this story about your hunt and your uh, your your fat dog. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> that's funny. Well, that's great. That was sounded like a lot of fun. You know, you have uh, Jennifer very jealous because she, my wife, who is also a, a hunter, and she's jealous because the hunts down here in Florida don't start for another two months, so she has to wait. I know, I know. But that's when ours wrap up. So, you know, her yeah, season so starts and ours, ours ends. But, you know, we'll just have to fly her up here. We'll wait for airfare to kind of drop and then we'll get her up here and go out. It's a, I, It was a nice field, too. I, um, I know we mentioned that in the in the segment, but m- meaning it was a nice field that it was full of competent riders, which makes things just flow really easily. And, I, and I, that's one of the things I think Jennifer would really appreciate especially since she spent so much time serving as the hunt escort when she I was working there. I tell you, though, I used to like going to watch the hunts when all the drunks would fall off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a couple of funny stories, too. <laughs> I remember one guy, he was just three sheets to the wind, and he was on this, like, super fit, crazy hot thoroughbred. The guy had to be, like, I don't know, 300 pounds and, and pushing, like, 80. And he was just out of his mind. He kept trying to mount the horse from a stone wall. He'd come off. His girth was slipping. He kept trying to mount from the stone wall, but the poor guy kept falling off the stone wall before he could get his foot in the stirrup. (laughs) (laughs) So he finally just, he falls backwards and he's laying in like brambles and pricker bushes. And he just puts his hand up. He's like, I'm good. I'm just going to stay right here. (laughs) You know, scratched and bleeding, totally drunk. I was like, I don't know if hunting is for me. But uh, but I have to say, he was not a member of the Myopia Hunt. He was not <laughs> okay. a subscribing member. Yeah, that clarifies it. Yeah. Well, we're going to be doing our Tack and Habit segment next. But, you know, I got an email, Helena, about Tack or Habit. And somebody was uh, whining that we do 15-minute infomercials for stuff. And I think it must have been a new listener who doesn't realize how Tack and Habit actually started. So maybe... 
now's a good time to explain why we do this segment and how it started. Um, so Tack and Habit used to be its own show. Uh, Glenn and in Jennifer, Coach Jen from Horse Tip Daily and I, um, we spent a lot of time talking about gear, about stuff, especially Jen and I. And we've spent our share of time shopping for stuff. Bits and, and bridles. All, and, and we all worked in that industry. We all, we worked, all worked in, in that. In well, was retail. Getting, yeah. getting to that. Oh, sorry. So we've, so we, right. and we've spent hours and hours at the equestrian trade shows and seeing what's new and whatever. So, um, and like any good horse person, you, it's important to have quality gear, stuff that works. It doesn't have to be the most expensive stuff. And, you know, so going out there and finding things that, that do what they say they're going to do is kind of a rarity in the equestrian world. And so that's how Tack and Habit was born. We wanted to find products that we thought were cool, find products that we thought were reliable and effective, and then bring them to you, talk about it. These, and, uh, and, and let's really clarify that these Tack and Habit segments are not paid segments. We at are, all. We are picking the products. Now, if they are, if we highlight something that's one of our sponsors, we tell you that. Um, so, yeah, you know, we do. Very, and we try not to do that. The idea was to find just cool stuff out of the blue and let's, and even things that we haven't tried before, we've just heard about and sort of, you know, oh, this sounds kind of cool. Let's, let's feature it. And then perhaps someone will, one of our listeners will call in or email us and say, Hey, I've tried that. It's great. Or it totally sucks. So the idea was to, to remain neutral about these products, but you know, because it's me and because it's Glenn, we, we get kind of impassioned about stuff. And when we find something that we love, well, we're going to tell you we love it. Uh, but it's in no way a paid advertisement for any of the products that we feature. And I, we only wish that the one we're talking about today would start advertising with us. We only oh, wish. Please. <laughs> if you know anybody there, let us know. Because right now we're, gonna, we're going to highlight one of the most expensive products we've ever done on Attack and Habit. And that is, brought, that is brought to you. The segment is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. We'll be right back with the most expensive Attack and Habit product yet. Choosing a supplement can be confusing. How do you know which ones are right for your horse? Kentucky Performance Products will simplify your search for effective, research-proven supplements that meet the challenges of today's horses. And this week's highlight product is Contribute Omega-3 Fatty Acid Supplement. The properties of omega-3 fatty acids benefit every system in your horse's body. Contribute improves breeding efficiency in mares and stallions. Maintain soundness and protects joints from damaging inflammation. Sustains a strong immune response in horses of all ages and decreases the levels of inflammation in your horse's body by sustaining adequate omega-3 fatty acid levels. Learn more about Contribute Omega-3 Fatty Acid Supplement and all the other products at kppusa.com. That's Kentucky Performance Products at kppusa.com. So tell us, Helena, what the biggest tack and habit item ever is. The biggest, most expensive tack and high ha- tack <laughs> cut. <laughs> the biggest, most expensive tack and habit item is drum roll, please. Oh, wait a minute. I was kidding, Glenn. Oh, was, well, uh, that's the best I can do. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it wasn't too bad. Just a little. I have no rhythm. Arrhythmical. Is that a word? Arrhythmical? <laughs> probably to me, now it is. Um, it's a 2012 Chevrolet Silverado truck. A oh, truck. A truck. I got a, a brand truck. new pick em up. A brand new pick em up. And this baby can pick em up. So when oh, did you yeah. get it? Uh, I got it two weeks ago. And I, we talked briefly about it um, on last week's show, but I want to put pictures up and really just tell people how much I love this thing. Love, love, love this truck. Great. Now, you haven't had a, a proper pickup in a while. You've been a horse I've, girl without a truck. I've never had a pickup truck ever in my life. Really? I've never driven my own pickup truck. Nope. Oh, okay. Nope. Um, and it's been quite a long time since I've had a new car, you know, the nine years. Some people might think that's not a long time, but for me, it's a long time. And so we traded in the, my favorite car though, my Subaru Outback, all wheel drive rock star of a car. I love that thing. 
um, it was very, very hard to trade it in. And even Gracie was just, she was very conflicted over the loss of the Subaru. So we, uh, we, I researched ad nauseum all the trucks that could pull a trailer. What kind of engine do I need? Who's got the best ride? Who's got the best price? Who's got the best reliability? And most importantly, who can tow the most? <laughs> who can tow the most of my price range? And um, I sat and people, in. People, you and don't broke... understand. Helena researches oh. things to death. Drives I me crazy. Think. She will research it and research it and research it. So this has been well researched. It's yes, if anything, it's been well researched. And you know, at the end of the day, you're going to buy something, especially when you're buying a big, big ticket item like an automobile. You're going to buy what fits into your what fits your needs and into your budget. So there's there's always compromise. But I have to say that the um, the Chevy that I bought didn't have a lot to compromise on. Really, the only thing that I feel like I gave up was the length in the truck bed. And I'll explain why. You got the six so, foot one? We, uh, it's it's 5.8 inches. Yeah, yeah. So I do have a little bit of truck bed envy. <laughs> some, <laughs> of my, some of my other friends have trucks with bigger beds. This one's easier to park. <laughs> and it's, so it's easier to park, but you know what? Size matters. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> You're one of those girls. I am one of those girls. <laughs> yes, I am. Gosh darn it. So um, uh, so anyway, what we ended up going with was the crew cab. We, um, the truck has a 5.3 liter engine. Now, Chevy offers several different engine sizes and configurations from 4.8 to 6 point something. Um, I went the fi- with the 5.3 liter V8 because it can tow um, up to 9,000 pounds. And I only have one horse and will likely get um, some kind of stock trailer. I'm not going to go and spend all kinds of money on a big fancy trailer. Um, And so we calculated as close as I could estimate that we probably need to tow about 7,500 pounds. So going with the engine that could pull 9,000 pounds safely, I thought was the best, um, the best way to go. And um, it has to be a family car because I can't afford to have an automobile and a truck. We're just, we don't make that kind of money. So I ended up going with the crew cab, which has a full-size back seat, and I am very, very happy that I did. Now, a few weeks ago, uh, we took Gracie to a show not too far from us, and as we pulled into the showgrounds, um, there were I had to be at least six or seven Chevy trucks parked with their trailers attached. And I was just in heaven because I'm going to go and like, talk to every one of them. What do you like about your truck? What made you decide to buy it? You know, do you like the crew cab? Do you like the extended cab? And hands down, all the moms that were there went for the crew cab. They said, absolutely, if you have kids, if you have dogs, if you have stuff, go with the crew cab Your because you really... wouldn't fit in the smaller cab. <laughs> no, we have a St. Bernard. And, and don't laugh, but that was part of why we went with the crew cab. And so I lost a couple of inches in the truck bed, but I gained really... a. A more flexible family vehicle. And let's let's face it, you know, unless you're going to shows or hauling furniture, you're you're in the truck more than you're hauling stuff in the back of the truck. So exactly, you know, exactly. That, that's, you know. The the other thing I gave up, and this was I had to give it up for budget reasons. But one of the things that we'd love to do is go down to our local beach and tailgate. And in the Subaru, we used to lift the hatchback, and in the back of the Subaru, we would get like pizza, or we would sit there and you know, basically eat takeout and look at the waves. And it was nice because you were kind of in the protection of the hatchback. Not that, you know, anybody bigger than me or Grace could fit in there, but we didn't want to give up that little option. So I looked at the big Suburbans, you know, the big SUVs and the Tahoes and the Ford Expeditions. And oh my God, can I just say rip off? (laughs) Rip off. I mean, yeah. it's amazing how much more money they charge for those things. And all you're getting is like a cap with a yeah. third row. I, we, the, the, the model that I got can seat six people comfortably. So that's a pretty good deal. Well, that is. That is. And, you know, I, I, uh, we had a Chevy truck, too. It was one of our first trucks we ever had to haul uh, when we were going to shows and stuff. So we're, and we had that truck forever. Now, tell me, you said that, and this is an edu- the educational part of this. By the way, congratulations. Um, and for the educational part of this, and I didn't know this, that when you went in the dealer, actually, there's something special for business owners like us, like we all are. Well, you know, um, I, 
I had asked them, you know, part of sort of getting the best price that we could get on this truck was, well, do you have any specials and promotions? And um, this is my budget. This is my price point. What kind of promotions do you have that you can fit into my budget? And, uh, oh, by the way, I'm self-employed. You know, I own my own business. And it turns out that General Motors has a really good promotion for small business owners. A lot of people that go in to buy trucks, um, well, are, to be honest, are, are men. They're contractors or they're builders or um, – you know, there's a lot of self-employed uh, craftsmen. And uh, so it's in GM's best interest to kind of appeal to that market. So, of course, I say, well, I'm in the horse business and uh, not in the traditional sense, but I'm in it. And, um, you know, yeah, this this is my go-to vehicle. And I was able to upgrade the trim level to get all the almost all the bells and whistles um, that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to afford because I am a small business owner. I just had to give them um, a copy of my tax return proving that I've filed and as a business, as a small business, and I got several thousand dollars worth of upgrades like leather interior, uh, fog lights, running boards, uh, protective bed rails, which are a big deal, a um, bunch of other stuff. XM radio, all kinds of little things that I would not have paid for because we're on a budget. But uh, yeah, pretty good deal. Huh. So I guess the lesson here is to ask or speak up. You never know what kinds of promotions or what kind of deals they're going to be willing to get or to, to give you because you're a farm owner or you're a trainer or you're a veterinarian or you're a horse breeder. Just who knows? You won't. Who knows unless you ask, right? Well, that's terrific. Well, this is very good. So, so far, you've only had it for a couple of weeks, but uh, so far it's on the approved list. It is so on the approved The ride is so smooth, way better than the Ford. I mean, I thought that I was going to buy a Ford until I drove the Chevy. And um, it just, it handles a lot better. The cabin space is so huge. It's definitely roomy. Um, And yet, there are a lot of features that make it great for a woman. For example, the gas pedal actually can move closer to the seat so you don't have to pull and your that's seat that's really up. good for a woman named helena who's about five foot two and three quarters exactly exactly <laughs> it was brilliant they have all the most important like you know hand controls from the steering wheel i can adjust the radio i i can even make phone calls for my steering wheel isn't that nice that's fun that is yeah fun. and here I mean, you I know are that... finally getting into the tech world <laughs> I laugh because I used to be so like ahead of the curve being in the industry for so long. And now I'm so far behind the curve. I just I feel a day late and a dollar short to everything technological. But uh, yeah. And so but the nice thing about Chevrolet is that they have fully incorporated all of this new technology into their truck. So it's not just, you know, their cars right. that, that they're working. The, 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 the truck is as functional as it is fun. Very good. Well, that's the Chevrolet Silverado 1500. 1500. And you can, prices range from, I went with a, a 4x4, um, but prices range anywhere from twenty six to $39,000. My vehicle, you probably, depending on what, what kind of promotions you get, we're looking at somewhere around twenty eight, maybe thirty. Great. Well, congratulations again. I can't wait to see you actually driving it one of these days when we get up there. We'll go for a joyride. Uh, and, and for all of you uh, Ford lovers and Dodge lovers out there who want to send us hate mail, you can send it to Helena at horseradionetwork.com. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs> this always brings up the debate, you know, because horse people are always dead set on one thing or another. Uh, they, and and I, I had no opinion beforehand. I just did the research and drove the vehicles, and this was the one that I came up you're with. You're one of the very few that dad don't have opinions on that, because usually you grew up in a family that's diehard something, you know? Well, all of my family worked for Ford. My grandfather worked oh, for really? Ford. My father worked for Oh, yeah. I've had pretty much nothing but Fords until uh, we got the Subaru. Huh. So I thought for sure I was going to buy a Ford. Ooh, I can feel my father just like rolling over <laughs> his grave. <laughs> But at least he'll be happy that at least I bought an American truck. There you go. 
Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us this week. We'll be back again next week with another new show. Don't forget about all the other shows in the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. You can uh, catch the other one of the other ones I do uh, is the driving radio show. I do it with Dr. Wendy Ying. She is a veterinarian and a traditional Chinese medicine doctor, and she does updates almost every week on the show about traditional Chinese medicine. Very interesting stuff that I never knew before. So uh, you can catch that over at Horse Radio Network as well. Well, another show's closing. I have to say thank you to Sissy Finn, my partner in crime, who convinced me to make the haul up there and go hunting. Best decision ever. I will be back in that hunt field soon and hopefully with Brody. Um, So thank you for all your adventures. I'm sure we'll have her back, Glenn, won't we? She's got them. She just keeps coming up with them. Yep. And uh, so I hope you guys will all tune in and um, find out what kind of adventures we've got next week. Happy scooping. 